Bonjour, euh, merci euh, à ceux qui sont là aujourd'hui. On est de retour après des témoignages euh, et euh, on va commencer notre premier atelier qui, euh, que, qui va être animé ou co-animé avec moi, avec euh, euh, Madame André Herjo, en fait, Docteur André Herjo, qui est médecin de famille maintenant à la retraite, mais euh, je pense que c'était sa pratique dans la région de Québec. Et puis, euh, mais elle va aussi faire un témoignage parce qu'elle est aussi. Donc, elle va nous faire un témoignage. Le titre de l'atelier, c'est Comment amener les médecins à penser au rare. Euh, on va essayer d'échanger, de, de, de trouver des solutions avec vous, là, euh, qu'on pourra, euh, des solutions qu'on pourrait voir après poursuivre, là, pour sensibiliser euh, le plus possible le milieu médical. Alors, André, si tu veux ouvrir ton micro et je te laisse la parole. Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Vous oui. m'entendez? Oui, bonjour. Alors, merci de m'avoir invité. Merci aussi au RQMO qui a fait vraiment une panoplie de, de conférences tout le mois de février, toutes plus intéressantes l'une que l'autre. Alors, moi, je suis ici ce matin comme médecin de famille, comme personne avec une maladie rare, et, et ma fille qui a une maladie rare. Alors, euh, je vais mettre euh, mes lunettes. Alors, euh, moi, j'ai été diagnostiquée à l'âge de 55 ans, suite au diagnostic de ma fille. Ma fille a été diagnostiquée à l'âge de 25 ans. Et j'avais beaucoup moins de symptômes qu'elle, mais j'avais tout de même des symptômes, mais j'en parlais pas parce que euh, je me disais qu'on allait me faire un diagnostic psychiatrique. Euh, notre maladie, c'est le syndrome de l'air dans l'os, et il y a le symptôme dans tous les systèmes. Alors, comme médecin, je me disais, je sais que j'ai quelque chose, je sais qu'il se passe quelque chose, mais je suis mieux de pas en parler. Ma fille était beaucoup plus atteinte que moi. Elle était malade, euh, elle avait des symptômes dès la naissance, mais vraiment vers l'âge de 12 ans, euh, les symptômes sont devenus euh, euh, une embûche euh, aux études à faire quoi que ce soit. Alors, euh, il a fallu euh, aller en diagnostic. Elle a eu un premier diagnostic d'arthrite qui l'a amené à prendre des médicaments biologiques qui ont fait qui ont eu chez elle des, euh, des effets secondaires importants et surtout de l'inefficacité. Alors, les médicaments étaient inactifs. She had to remain inactive. After several years, she was given a diagnosis of somatoform troubles. I'm sure that many people see this. Uh, um, uh, get can relate to that. They had all, we talk about fictitious disorders, uh, conversion problems, and depression, and other diagnoses like fibromyalgia. Alors, je vais vous lire la, la, la définition abrégée du DSM-5, du trouble somatoforme. Alors, premièrement, on sait que c'est un diagnostic d'exclusion. Quand on ne trouve rien, qu'on sait we find nothing, well, there are two little boxes that we can check off and we can say, okay, we're going to continue. So, the, the somatoform diagnosis is held after an appropriate, that we deem appropriate assessment. And when the symptoms are explained by a known condition, medical condition. And so I'm going to talk about the trajectory about the known medical physician, known to a physician, a physician that will investigate you, not known by all of science. It is here where things are acted out and played. I will say at the same time, oddly enough, I started thinking at one point, perhaps somatoform disorder does not exist. Perhaps it's just what we physicians do not know about, and we'll put it in the box or in the file. Oh, we'll look into that one day. And if it were not a somatoform disorder, and if the physician had not thought about it, and if the doctor didn't know at all, and if the education of a physician set aside forgot to train us, open our eyes for those 7,000 rare diseases. That's where we start. And those who are here in attendance today will recognize themselves. How can we lead a doctor to thinking farther, farther than 
just simply stopping oh well i don't know it's somatoform it's a somatoform it's fibromyalgia it's a conversion disorder etc so there are several tiers to this and this is what we're going to discuss and the first tier will be training and education physicians must be trained and educated and of course they cannot learn about 7000 diseases or rare diseases but they can know that there are places where we can turn we can send our clients to dig and probe deeper within the diagnosis, perhaps the RQMO. I did not know of it. I discovered it with my daughter. And one must, or the physician, how might I put it? I forgot to tell you, I have uh, slight memory blanks, and that's why I stopped working. I have uh, sometimes cognitive uh, little... Uh, inconsistencies and it happens i forgot to mention it we have to know all the registries and we have to know the source we have to know where to turn to have access to the registry what i saw in the past month i was able to attend a few presentations and i've noticed that there are more and more so registries that are sophisticated they are truly sophisticated where we can include genes symptoms in an attempt to uncover something. Therefore, one must know where to turn to consult this. And so we complete university and the, the GP Federation through its continuing education should more and more so open up to these possibilities. Next, questions by patients, and we're going to address those later on and to specify the diagnosis, etc. Therefore, when we don't have a diagnosis, what do we do with the physician before us? We have to try to lead him to move farther. How do we do that? Firstly, we never confront, of course. We never, never confront given, I mean, it doesn't yield anything regardless of the question. And secondly, we have to be well prepared for these interviews because we are the specialist of our condition. We are the specialist of what is happening to us. Therefore, ahead of time, we must prepare our interview, describe the symptoms, define them for what they are exactly and to also define them in time the timeline what happens compared to what what happened to be specific but not to be lengthy you have to pinpoint all of these symptoms you can't say when i was at such and such a place no on such and such a date such and such a thing happened as a result of such and such a thing and that's how we'll get there and unfortunately when physicians see us they don't have much time less and less so because they're trying to impose many more clients and you heard about it especially with gps many people are left without a gp so we have to lead this specifically and we have to also follow up on medical reports and convey them forward them and also to inform them on the timeline and the symptoms we can control others but we can control ourselves and how we provide the information how we can follow up on files how we can make it such that a physician will have a, all of the information on hand in order to raise questions to see what's happening and what's going on one of the questions that i've used on a few occasions especially with my daughter when she received a somatoform disorder diagnosis when she was younger, she was uh, sort of uh, claimed to be manipulative. I said, do you think it's manipulation? Okay, help me understand how this could be manipulation. Please describe the symptoms to manipulation. We'll review this together. And we did review them together. It didn't make sense. So there was no manipulation. So same thing for somatoform disorder. I said, help me understand now in terms of the somatoform disorder after eliminating everything else because there are criteria to somatoform disorder i said help me understand how my child could present with this and then when we sift through it and then we see that there are gaps and we see that this is not the case we can't just say oh well this is it and i don't believe it no we really have to go by the question that helped me most of all was help me understand how in other words I will abide by what you're saying. Help me understand. If that doesn't work, we have to go elsewhere and search elsewhere. That's the message I had to convey. This is based on my experience. I could talk to you about it for some time because it was 55 years for me and a whole of 13 years for my daughter. And so now what we're also releasing while discussing, I want to know what your experience was like. I want to know what your ideas are like because we each have a a journey lasting several years and other ideas might assist everyone, uh, things that we haven't experienced as of yet. 
Thank you, Andre. Thank you for this introduction. In my presentation this morning, I also detailed the issue of psychosomatic diagnoses. And I wanted to mention until recently, it was very difficult to address. Even when I would try to discuss it with physicians, it wasn't uh, well received. And I find that now, in the past few months, I find that in my conversations and in presentations, it appears to be a little more, well, there are people who are a little more attuned. And truly, based on what you're describing, your training and education, once we've gone through all the tests, the exams, nothing is uncovered, and then there's only somatoform disorder left as a diagnosis, well, then we have there has to be a shift in the paradigm. And we have to change our way of doing things. But truly, I believe that physicians feel attacked. Perhaps we accuse them when speaking of this, but we have so many testimonials about these things happening in the healthcare system. And as I said, we will soon have statistics to present for the specific syndrome that you addressed, but we must really engage in the conversation. And you asked a very good question. Does it truly exist? Does, what's it called? The Bible of those psychiatric disorders? You mean the DSM? That's right, the DSM. Now, Really, perhaps they had included plenty of people with rare diseases in their assessment of the diagnoses. Oh, certainly, of course. I have an example that everybody knows and all the people of my age group, uh, abdominal uh, ulcers issues. We were told they were psychosomatic in 1980 when I studied in 1985. But they, they were said to be psychosomatic and suddenly they, uh, I mean, they just, they realized that it was E. pylori, basically it was that bacteria. And uh, something that you said as well, and when speaking to physicians, they feel attacked. Well, personally, as a physician, I never really felt attacked. I always felt powerless. And so at times, if we change our way of seeing things with regard to physicians and before we are sitting, it'll be easier to interact with personally because I know today that I missed two rare diseases in my life and I was I didn't have access to these people. I was very disappointed. I was in the Ottawa region. I no longer have the files. I have nothing left. I'm certain these two people had rare diseases. I never told them it was psychosomatic. I said, I don't know what you have. And I send them to see plenty of physicians. I said, I don't know. Perhaps one day the symptoms will be more specific and we'll know, but I never know never told them that it was psychosomatic. To me, it was impossible to even mention that. But the feeling that I had before certain people for whom I had a hard time to diagnose, it was a feeling of powerlessness because I was raised as a physician and also fabricated as a physician to also change our glasses. Sometimes we have to change our glasses when we don't have the diagnosis. And certainly some physicians feel attacked. I'm certain, but I don't think this accounts for the majority, but some, yes, some are, you know, I, uh, insecure and uh, there could be a closure. We have to try to open the door without attacking them to ask them, please help me understand. But I felt powerlessness and helplessness. And even more so, you didn't have any resources you didn't know where to turn. Where am I going to refer this patient to whom? What are we going to do? That's right. And then when you refer to several people, they come back to you. But we must look into because if the physician, if we manage to have a good connection with the physician, he's going to continue searching with us. And at least we're not going to live because it's horrible to not be believed. I think it's cruel to not be believed. It's cruel when we don't believe our child. We're not going to live that. And when leaving the communication channels open, and we're going to say, okay, it's not going well, we haven't found, but he believes me. And so it gives energy to move on positively and to observe the symptoms. And it opens me up to better intervene for my child, for myself, towards a physician, towards the healthcare system, because 
I mean, we're talking about the entire healthcare system. It's comprehensive. We see it with the nurses even more so in ER rooms. Some will say it can be, I'm going to say, wait a minute. Oh, yes, it can be. It was diagnosed. And then, no, 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 no. Well, listen, when you're confronted with many, many people, when my daughter was in a hospital, they wanted to uh, train her because they said she, they claimed that she was doing it on purpose. She didn't want to try walking and they wanted to train her. It's an entire system altogether and they wanted to bring in the physio. But one must remain open. We must lead the person and even hold by the hand in order to uh, go through this journey. Thank you. We're going to uh, take a look. I don't have the window before me. Uh, okay, I think I will have it momentarily. If there are comments, people who want to comment, this is a workshop, as Andre said, we want you to talk to us about your experience, but especially we are here also to find solutions, to provide advice. You can also, you may ask Andre for some advice. She's just provided very good ideas. Is there anyone? If there are no questions, another thing, another idea that might prove to be interesting is that you come up with a summary of the last month that just elapsed with all the new databases and how to access them. This might prove to be interesting that people could take to their physician. The databases, the data banks, the ones I referred to earlier, well, the one in France, the one that was with us, yes, that I will specify that. And then one person raised the hand, let me specify. And we started a project last fall on the patient registry. And in Quebec, the situation is as follows. And in all of Canada, in fact, the situation, no, such a rare disease registry does not exist. When we given the number of 7,000 people with rare diseases in Quebec, uh, nobody has an idea. There were no epidemiological studies, and the, we don't have a central epidemiologist in this respect. And the cases used at RAMQ are rather for pathologies and are rather for billing purposes. Therefore, not per disease. In fact, there are common diseases involved, but rare diseases inexistent. And therefore, there are no specific cases to put together statistics and the the electronic medical file is an entire story here it's common we started barely a year ago in quebec with a file where not everything is quite centralized as of yet so it's not possible to determine or to know therefore there are initiatives that i referred to there is even more so than that elsewhere we are now waiting there's the uh, Réseau Ensemble uh, with the University of Sherbrooke and RQMO is a partner with Dr. Bergen at the University of Paris. What we aim to achieve is to use AI to for this digital access and to access all of the data related to medical files. And they want this specifically for rare diseases. So to find in a medical file of those individuals who are similar with a similar symptomatology. And then we can get back to the physician and suggest a diagnosis and suggest and uh, to assess them together. And then next, we don't, I mean, plenty of people were uncovered with certain manifestations and it's not centralized and now we'll have the uh, molecular diagnostic uh, central in quebec it's going to be done here and so we're going to have a database or a data bank and we'll include the already existing uh, genetic uh, statistical results but you don't have to wait after these local initiatives there are initiatives that exist elsewhere associations, patient associations, especially from the US, they're fed up of waiting for physicians to set, set up registries. And when they do so, researchers, clinicians, it, they will uh, reformat the registry in their own way and they'll enter the data they want to put in coming from their medical records and they need the resources it's costly some disappear therefore they got fed up those 
large associations started to say, we'll come up with our own registry platforms. And uh, yes, they worked with the INIH, the FDA, for all of this to be compatible with, uh, for the purpose of research and medications and standardization of data. And what's special about these registries is that the people can enter their data themselves personally. And there could be questionnaires people will complete and researchers will propose research projects and questionnaires. The data belong to the patient. They control the data they want to make available for the purpose of research. Of course, researchers and any other individual will leave the data anonymous, but it helps research move forward. For your information, there's a norm in the US National Organization uh, of Resources. They have one for the non-diagnosed. In the US, they're very advanced. For those without a diagnosis, they have a network operated by the NIH that brings together 13 large American centers called Undiagnosed Network. And they, any physician can present the file to somebody, to this network, to these centers to illustrate the diagnosis. Of course, there are Canadians that wanted to participate, but it's not very possible. So this is challenging because you have the registries and these can even enable us to find somebody who doesn't have a diagnosis, to find people who are similar to you. There's a, a, my G2 at the Washington University and it can include the certain variables that were found. We compiled all of this and indexed everything in the fall we have a person taking care of this. And we will publish the list of all, there, there are approximately 150 that we have indexed and most are for specific diseases, which means that somebody knows his or her diagnosis, but there, this exists for the non-diagnosed and also for the famous Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, there is one. And even if we don't have the specific diagnosis and we suspect this diagnosis, we can also enter this data. And this is a wide international study underway. Now, we are holding a campaign to say, we are not waiting. We do not know. Research takes time. And this year, we will set up a register that for everybody who wants to enter this data. As I said, there are 150 for specific diseases, but we would want people to be able to enter data regardless of their disease. Yes, but even for the non-diagnosed, the one from the SHU, and they take all the ones that are currently non-diagnosed, that's from the shul. Yes, but those are research projects and and they have recruitment criteria. They'll enter people and then they'll compile a data bank and then it will be between researchers because there were other groups. I don't know if you heard uh, Care for Rare. It's Canada wide and they share the data and that way they have found diagnoses as such. Yes, but how, if they are undiagnosed here in Quebec, how can they have access to these platforms via their physician? And those without a diagnosis, they're wondering, and they're asking, well, I would like somebody to look into this data bank if I uh, put in something, how to proceed if I want to enter data? Well, there are only such few groups that proceed that way. There's Dr. Jacques Michaud that was mentioned earlier, and he's at St. Justine's Children's Hospital. And Dr. Jacques Michaud does this type of research, has been doing so for several years. He has a pediatric a clinical a genomics center that is referred to. And there's this special, there's a specialist in Quebec. There was another initiative. I don't know if it's still underway at the CHU, C-H-U-S in Sherbrooke. And so the there are some, and it calls for specific criteria to enter the data. And we could always add it on the site, but the physician must contact these researchers, these physicians to know if 
the person is eligible for this project. Not everybody can be. So the person without a diagnosis could check your platform to see which projects are underway, hand this over to their physician and be contacted. Well, we haven't included them because we are speaking to our iRare Center. We could do so, and if people want to contact them, but I forewarn you, this is at the stage of research. You need to understand this very clearly. This is at the research stage, and it calls for specific criteria to enter into such a project, and it calls for a great deal of time. Some people have waited for years before we found something. And again, still plenty of people waiting. For example, Serge Vidé, researcher, has said that there were 40 or 140, 150 families and finally resolved with 30. And that's what one must understand. I'm not going to say it's easy to access. Now, what we require, what we require thus far, this was turned down. What they do is exonic sequencing, and this was refused to do so automatically in clinic when one suspects a genetic syndrome. Thus far, this was assessed under order of the ministry, Ines, a few years ago, and they said no. But now we, took it, we are putting together in Quebec the Molecular Diagnostic Network in Quebec, where we'll have our sequencing platforms here in Quebec because we would greatly send tests, we'd outsource these tests, and part of them will be in Montreal, the other part in Quebec, and then we hope and this too might not be in 2022. We hope that this type of sequencing be become a clinical test. We discussed and spoke with Madam Kristen Kernahan, who presented for Care for Rare earlier during our webinars. And in Ontario, they decided to start offering it in clinics. So it, this is it. It's not moving quickly, but this is where things are at. For the time being, it's at the stage of research, but an information registry can certainly help move research forward. They exist, and for the non-diagnosed, and we want to set one up here in Quebec for researchers to use. Okay, so there was... Uh... Uh, Mrs. Um, the first one who raised her hand is Ms. Nathalie Martin. Uh, Martel, could you give her the floor? Nathalie Martellino. Can you hear me well? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Ah, okay. I haven't heard your family name, your Dr. Andre. Yerjo. Yerjo. It starts with a Y. Ah, okay. I have a question to ask you because I was listening uh, and I was uh, listening to the approach you were suggesting when we go see a physician. And it's so much what I was doing where uh, that they have little time and they're very objective, rational people. It's not the time to start speaking, blah, blah, blah. And so I came with pre-prepared documents I did summaries of lab results. I summarized this in a table. I had a table about endocrine disorders, uh, cardio results to make things easier, but it, but it played against me because I was considered as the person who wants to interfere. And I've seen a physician, I, want, I wasn't so nice. I can't, I, I can't be lobotomized. If you want me to be lobotomized, I'm not going to do that. And, you know, it, it, it was playing against me. Um, and I went to, through all possible approaches. Sometimes people will tell me, say nothing, come there, go there as everybody else. But that's no better because it's too vast. It, it leaves things too much open. And the attitude at the beginning, I even told them, listen, if you find it, I, I'm, I'm giving you weeks of my time for free. I, I will work for you. I'll clean up your files or whatever. There is no single method I haven't tried, but I realize that more often than not, when I'm ex excessively well prepared and I come uh, with a word like clevis and the doctor doesn't know what it is, and I have a whole page on clevis, and then at one point I was told, you should stop go 
going to uh, consulting Dr. Google. I was so much insulted. I went to the library of the Faculty of Medicine. I read medical publications. I'm not uh, consulting Dr. Google. So it's difficult uh, to find the right approach. You're, you're so right. You're right. You are right. And what I learned, Beth guess being a doctor, what I understood with my daughter, I was judged as this doctor is crazy. I was judged. You should not listen to that. You should do not listen to that. Listen to your own inner voice and say, I want to diagnose. I have a diagnosis. I want to be treated. I want to do what is not. But damned if you do, damned if you don't, you know that expression. You're judged, you're passed in judgment if you do it, you're passed in judgment if you don't do it. It's it's like that and it will always be like that if you find good information you bring good information you are right if you don't do it and you come with nothing you will never have a diagnosis so how can i say you have to become you have to stop caring about judgment the important thing is the the outcome because yes you will always be judged and i i know that this is with my daughter it took us three, 13 years and it was terrible. She was, when she received the diagnosis of somatoform disorder, it took four weeks because each week at the hospital, the doctor was changing. It took four weeks before the physician says, it looks like the syndrome of ladder. Don't you see what Pepe said? Everybody told me, it tells me it doesn't make sense. And I would like to see this. And after four weeks, she looked at that and she said, it's not what you say makes sense. Look, I'll call the genetician and we'll send you there this week. She saw the genetician. She got out of hospital quickly. That was the diagnosis. She They sent her to rehabilitation, but it took four weeks. It took three weeks before. It was three weeks of horror, but we persevered. We continued. And I said to myself, they can judge me. I know my daughter better than they do. The third week, it's a doctor who works with me in the clinic who was there. And he told me, well, but Andre, why do you want your daughter to be sick? What are you talking about? I said, because it's a, maybe a syndrome, a Munchausen syndrome. You're not serious. I know you. I know it doesn't make sense. It was the fifth week. We have to get your daughter out of here. It doesn't make sense. It took someone who knew me, who had known me for a long time to say, come on, she is not crazy. And I was judged while I have knowledge. You will always be judged, but you're right. If you stay open, respectful, continue like that. This is the only piece of advice I can give you. Yes, by the way, there is a person who wrote to us in the chat. I don't know uh, if that person wants to clarify. When I consider that the doctor is helping me, I make it a duty to thank him. I found a family physician. The uh, inflammatory breast cancer is often misdiagnosed. I sent a letter to the doctor who suspected it, which might have allowed me to be diagnosed before I had metastases. So I think this is the key. I'm sure that after experiencing all these obstacles with physicians, we can sometimes feel very aggressive, right? Yes, but that person wasn't af afraid to do things differently. She wrote, she said, thank you. She wasn't afraid of doing things differently. She trusted herself. Yes, for people like the lady who just spoke, it's certain that it never helps. Uh, to 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 be in a conflict as you say you should not be in a conflict but you have to trust yourself in the steps you take in the research you make in the symptoms you see in our child on or, or the symptoms we feel in ourselves we have to trust ourselves and to tell show them that we're sure of what we're saying and trust ourselves and we could can do things differently write a letter to a doctor a lot of people you wouldn't dare do that they're not untouchables you can write to them to see what happens if he gets angry you calm down you, you will lose faith, but that's it. That's all. In the, you're okay. In, in, my, in the guide we will publish, that's the piece of advice they give. You know better. They, in the, if you write things down, it has to be brief, to the point. We heard stories of people who come up with their suitcases, their folders. Okay, we understand this because the files are not centralized but often it's not very well received by the physicians uh, because the person wants to show their whole file, unfortunately. But be organized, present the new symptoms only. It happened 
I came up with a sheet with all the symptoms in bullet form, in point form, and they said, put this in your electronic file. And the doctor is, okay, you just, okay, I will look at this together. I'll put this in the electronic medical record. And if he's not happy, just put it aside, show it to somebody else. But already it helped you good, make a good synthesis in your mind. But by putting things in, on paper, it helps us doing a good summary. It helps us better understand ourselves too at the same time. Yes, I had the experience of accompanying some patients at specialist appointments. And in one case, I accompanied a lady to a specialist X. And uh, when we entered uh, the consulting room, the lady who wanted to say everything and speak about everything and our whole situation and from the beginning how it progressed and the doctor stopped her right away i'm sorry madam but i'm a specialist of this please tell me why you're here you must have problems with this system tell me that and we'll see what we can do you said it time is short they don't have the time and that's a problem for rare diseases because of course it must require more time. It has to require more time when you have a rare disease. And that's coming out. There's a study that is being done by a PhD student at the Clinical Research Institute of Montreal. And it came out in the interviews. It is clear that often, especially with specialists, uh, the specialist appointments are very, very brief for known diseases. And, and you imagine for rare diseases, but somehow uh, there will have to be a place, there will have to be room for those people. Joanne spoke about something earlier. At one point, there was a multidisciplinary team that was put in place and they looked at this file together. That should be done. And I find also that I think that the doctors have a lot of trouble with is people who arrived and they had a lot of negative experiences. We don't deny that, but don't speak to us about it. We don't have time for that. What I want to hear today is what is not going well today. And we will try to make a diagnosis. Tell me the diagnosis that was right, but don't whine and complain about all, all the little problems you had before. We don't have time for that. We are wasting precious time and hearing bad things said about our confreres. We don't like this as anybody would do, but sometimes we waste a lot of time on this. Don't spend time on this. What is the problem today? What are the symptoms today? What diagnosis were done in the past and didn't work? What tests were done? What were the test results? And we start for a diagnosis. We start a journey towards a diagnosis. There's Miss Germain ici, who could uh, add what she wrote in the chat and say it in the microphone. What I wanted to clarify is that the ledger I sent was after the diagnosis, because when I discovered that uh, uh, it was time to clarify. And I just sent a letter, but the doctor at the end of the appointment knew what I had. That's what I wanted to say too. You said it, that you said that you were satisfied and you they found a diagnosis. Yes, I thanked them that he might have saved my life. I thanked him because I told him he, he might have saved my life. Thank you. That was the uh, uh, most important thing. That was the touchstone of my medical team. There's a 40 during my medical consultations. Andre, I don't know why we can't hear her because I had removed my microphone. Okay, I muted myself. But sometimes we forget to say thank you. It's very good to say thank you. It reinforces the link. Sometimes even a, a doctor that hasn't found the diagnosis and we see him again, don't be afraid to tell him. It's part of his learning. If that doctor is open enough, he or she might say, okay, I missed that. I saw this symptom. Okay, next time I won't miss that. The way, everything depends on the way it's said. Well, I know we didn't find it, but here is the diagnosis that was done. It was this or it was that, if you have an opportunity to say so. It's not a bad idea. It's part of the continuous education of doctors. Now, I don't see any other questions for the moment, but I would like us to come back on how you ask a question to the doctor, how you came back to the charge when they said for your daughter, it's a somatoform disorder. Calmly, you said, okay, but explain to me why you say it's a somatoform disorder. And at the same time, you said, 
when they said that she was manipulative explain to me why do you think why do you see that she is manipulating me why my daughter is manipulating me people are afraid of asking questions it happened to me with the doctor to tell myself afterwards when i was out of the office oh well, why didn't i ask this question i start with a, a question that wasn't asked and at what time is the right way to ask a simple question to get more explanations as in any other communication you, you don't ask the person to justify themselves about the diagnosis you say help me understand why it would be this or that what are the criteria for manipulation manipulation is when someone wants something that person will do everything to get it for example my daughter had the birthday of her best friend and she wanted to go on the morning but she couldn't okay and three weeks later it's the birthday of somebody else in her kindergarten class and the person who is not too too important for her and then she can't go and that doesn't work you say you say she manipulates me she wouldn't have gone to, to that one it's not a girl she likes so much i give him facts i want to think about this sometimes next time i think about it or i observe and somatoform disorder is when it doesn't suit her she develops symptoms and when she likes to do something she doesn't have any symptoms look that doesn't fit we were going to some place that she likes a lot she was not able to see because she had this or that symptom but now we were not doing anything one day she was in great shape and she she asked to do something we take the criteria you write them down and you tell the physician listen i will observe i will observe what you're telling me and we'll see if she it's true that she manipulates me don't be closed if you remain closed to any psychiatric disorder you're done you really have to observe for someone tells you your daughter is having a depression or your son is having a depression okay perfect okay depression there are a criteria for that the, 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 the affective this problems are there but someone comes to the house and suddenly she's in a good mood and everything goes fine and the next day she's alone and she's okay that's not a depression it's something else so you have to get the details and you can ask the physician um, you just have to photocopy what the doctor gives us and you collect the data with your child or with yourself for example i'll give you an idea depression versus um, bipolar disorder all right so people confuse the two but the bipolar disorder it, the effect is modulated without anything causing this it modulates the mood changes by itself and for the personality disorder problem the effect modulates with what happens someone gets mad you get mad you get into a crisis but in the bipolar disorder the per nothing will happen everything goes well and suddenly the person gets depressed that's bipolar but between the personality disorder where the person is depressed because someone says i don't like you and bipolar disorder you're depressed because it's a cycle those are the criteria how can we check i give you two easy things that's how i came to convince people i told them it doesn't make sense your criteria don't, don't work here is why here are the facts that have happened since then so people said oh well okay now it's difficult to justify i put things on paper i said put this in your file oh if i put this in my file i can't leave my dogs there i will look stupid i have to think about it twice that's the way i go that's good advice and you said it and it's said in the guide to you know you are the one who knows your child their real life experience and that's what you have to to to, to report that's what you have to say the doctor doesn't know uh, whether or not she went to a birthday or girl she loved or she didn't go the guide you prepared really deserves to be read right i gave it to you for a reading so much the better we'll launch that guide and that will help a person wrote to us and i even forgot to speak about this it was in my slides this morning when i listed the various disorders as you did the somatoform disorder fictitious disorder um, munchausen or proxy disorder and at the bottom of the slide what i forgot to say and oh those are realities we know which are reported to us i helped people with those situations too those are reports for conjugal violence for women who have um, bruises or fractures that can happen that could lead it could 
happen to adults, but reports to YPD, to the Youth Protection Directorate. Two types of reports, a real report from maltreatment or abuse that has happened in the past, and it still happens, or a report to youth protection because the way the, wor the YPD workers said, it's medical doggedness. They didn't say Munchausen, but they said acharnement médical. So here the person says that they had to go through psychiatrists, medical relentedness or medical overkill or obstinacy. People said I was making too many personal research. That was medical overkill. It, my daughter was told at the bedside that she was not sick and mom was harming her. What discourages me is doctors who say bad things about another doctor in, one, in the same clinic. Doctors who say bad things about another doctor working in the same clinic, that, that's what I don't like. So the situation of moms, mothers who are being accused of doing medical harassment. And there's a case we saw on our website. I even made a blog out of that. I came to the fore to explain what was the syndrome it's a hereditary syndrome. What the mother experienced when she was a child that has never been diagnosed with his daughter, her daughter is now experiencing the same thing and they have diagnosed it. So it's normal that the mother be afraid that her daughter will never have a diagnosis. She's afraid that uh, she, she, it's normal for the mother to do that. I hope I educated some workers on that, but you're right. It's a very difficult situation for the parents, I suppose. Yes, when you're not believed, I say this is cruelty. It's terrible. Indeed. In the study I spoke to you about, there are people who call this maltreated or abuse. And the other thing we noted is that it's not the competent people who make uh, psychiatric uh, diagnoses. Uh, there are people, we know people who had a diagnosis of bipolar disease, and this was written by the father, by a, a GP. There was no psychiatric assessment, and the GP wrote in the file bipolar. Uh, another case happened during a psychological assessment uh, a possible diagnosis of Munchausen by proxy, a mother, possibly Munchausen by proxy, but that was not assessed by a psychiatrist as far as I know. That happened to us too. You know better than I do. But those are psychiatric diagnoses that should be done by psychiatrists and not by any psychologist or physician. It, at least that's what I think. Yes, that's what we experienced. Munchausen, Munchausen by proxy, that's why my daughter went into hospital. I didn't see this in the file. It's the GP who had put that in the file instead of saying, let's send her to investi investigations to describe the problem she had. She made her diagnosis and that's why it went out of control during four weeks. It was horrible until my confrere told me, what do you want your doctor to be sick? I said, what, what, do you, what are you talking about? He didn't want to give me access to the file. He said, Andre, you have to, you, your daughter has to get out of here quickly. We have to do something. Then it opened the door to the real diagnosis. Yes, by the way, that too in my presentation, which you haven't seen, I think I spoke to you about that in person, but the specialized lawyer, the health special, uh, Maître Jean-Pierre Ménard, who is a lawyer specializing in health, I've met him to speak to him about those difficult situations. He spoke to me about the syndrome, they call this the syndrome of the page before. The page that was before the current page. Once a doctor has written in the file his suspicion that it could be psychosomatic somatoform, a psychiatric disease, that there is harassment of the medical field to find a supposedly rare disease. Once this medical obstinacy has been written in the file, uh, it follows and other doctors who read this in the file might already have a bias until we catch a physician uh, like uh, 
who could take the case. Like Joanne Delarger is telling us, there are other doctors who are ready to investigate further. But once it's written in the file, is the syndrome of laziness. Oh, we don't want to do. Okay, there was a diagnosis. No, it's a laziness also. But very often, doctors don't have the time. I'm telling you, I didn't practice that way. I practiced in a CLSC. I agreed to practice at a much lower rate to have the time to see people. We don't have the time to even want to put more patients per physician. It doesn't make sense. We have a lack of physicians in Quebec. At one point, they sent all doctors to retirement. They stopped training them so that it wouldn't cost them too much. Uh, we, we, uh, the results of what we sold, we were bearing the, the fruit. Uh, as an organization, we should also react to another situation. A lot of people with rare diseases already do not have a family physician, but on top of that, those who are looking for a diagnosis very often don't have any GP to support their process. There no, makes no sense. No conductor, no conductor, no coordination. I have one part of my list of participants in front of me. I don't see any raised hand, but I think I don't see the whole list. Uh, could you just tell me, Luc, if you see other hands raised? I don't want to miss anyone. Uh, uh, someone wrote, there's a question. How can we bring the doctors in a medical team to speak among themselves instead that we, the parents, should be the spokespersons among them? Because I feel like a child caught between two parents in a divorce. How can you bring uh, doctors to speak to each other? You know, they have a difficulty seeing all their patients. Uh, speaking together and hold, getting a hold of each other is difficult. So you have to make the physician to question themselves enough and to doubt their diagnosis sufficiently that they will want to go further and see if it could be something else. That's where the game is played. Now, we have to say also that now, you know, previously, the, the doctor in a private office took the time to call the specialist. He wasn't paid for the time he took to call. He could take 15, 20 minutes uh, of the, the, their time. Now they can be paid for that telephone time. That, so there's something very good that was done. So the GP who calls the specialist to get some information can be paid for it. That's already a good thing. But we really have to make doctors feel like they want to go further and saying all the things, all the tips I've given you earlier to open their minds. And before, before that, they have to, we have, they have to be educated. They have to be trained. The QMO is working on this to train these GPs, making sure that specialists who come out of university be open, know those things. Rare diseases, we've heard about a few genetic diseases, but uh, Dr. Grigil told me there's 7,000 rare diseases. I said, whoops, I have a, a, a couple are missing in my mind. And it takes all kinds of forms. And things may look very bizarre, like the Leavin loss symptom syndrome. I didn't know the, the, the Ehler Danlos, Ehler Danlos, Ehler Danlos, lacks our Jack's joints. We didn't know anything about Ehler Danlos. So the, the quiz, Genie en rare, the rare geniuses quiz that you prepared has to be generalized. It's something new and very important. Yes. And to clarify, of course, we had the consultation. Finally, after 12 years, we had a consultation with the Department of Health and Social Services, the MSSS, in January and with the other patient associations also, because of course, uh, specific disease associations exist for some people, uh, for other diseases, the management of the disease is an issue. So the solutions we proposed are the ones we think would be easy to implement. They wouldn't cost a lot. And we could do this first because the other solutions like creating specialized centers or and they're talking about referral centers and super regional centers. That will not happen quickly. We know that. So we also think that training in the faculties of medicine is what's required here. I don't know why we would wait two or three more years. And we took this initiative of uh, asking questions in the uh, rare disease geniuses quiz. 
questions are not just about diseases because they, they can't learn all those hundreds of diseases, but those are more questions about the approach. We put your voices in questions, what you said that you went through. We gave them questions about possible resources and it was a success. Some 30 students studied and they studied well because they had all the right answers on the last game and it's just a matter of quickness that the winning team differentiated itself and uh, we think that indeed uh, those are questions that we will make available but there's also continuous education of physicians who are already practicing we think we have to teach to them an approach about how can they understand patients with rare diseases, their families, their loved ones, their natural helpers, what is the diagnostic approach, and even the obstacle, knowing the obstacles that they have to face they don't have, when they don't have any services. So that's what we want to put forward. Uh, as I said, Saturday on Zoom is challenging. We'll give uh, people the opportunity to have lunch and to, to come back. We're going to leave uh, the province of Quebec. And the first presentation was pre-recorded with a group in England. And they manage a group of uh, people who are not diagnosed. And I held an interview with a testimonial also from a parent in England. Then we'll have Madame uh, Isabel uh, Jordan that experience an error in diagnosis. And also uh, under the Rare Disease Foundation, she participated in a study uh, while under her govern. And so thank you, Andre. Thank you so much. I think it was very enlightening. And I'm very happy that you said in the guide, there's also advice and it's similar to what you've said, but there are other pieces of advice and suggestions. And as I said, we're gonna continue our work with you in that respect. And I wish everybody good luck in getting a diagnosis. And please bear in mind, you must trust yourself. Thank you, thank you, Andre.